somebody asked me what the name Inch Dearney came from. So just over the road there, there used to be a long, long time ago, an uh, Inch Dearney house. Uh, there's a family that had been there since the 1600s. But Inch Dearney is two old Scots words. Inch meaning low-lying, close to water, and Dearney meaning hidden. So it's secret. So we're low-lying, secret, close to water. So that kind of takes up who we are, as Ian alluded to. We don't tell people what we've done until we've done it, so we keep it a little bit of a secret. So it's kind of part of our DNA, who we are. We'll only say something when we've got something to say. So what I'll do now is I'll take you around the, to the start of the process. I'll point out a few design-specific elements that gives you an idea of the thought process that went into getting us to where we are. And as always, if you have any questions, please just put your hand up just to get my attention. And we're all friends here, so there's no such thing as a silly question. So okay. you get to it later, but why are why? Yeah. Because when you add spirit to your vat, yeah. vapour comes out of it. Mm -hmm. So put it outside so it can breathe rather than put it in your distillery. That's why. There's no need for it. A lot of it was done in the distillery because that was a design. But that was a design concept long, long, long time ago. Ian and I are both uh, engineers, so that's the more modern approach because you put your vats outside. There's no need for it. And you'll see uh, there's a lot of distilleries that are upgrading their, their distilleries and they're all good for the same thing. They're putting their vats outside rather than being inside. Did, did you say your wash, washbacks too? Yeah, my washbacks. Okay. And, I, and I don't have a wooden washback. No. But I'll explain that a little, little bit later. Sure. So where we are standing here is if, on the other side of the road where the trees are is the main gas pipe that joins Glenlorthus to Kinglassy. So that's where I get my gas supply from. On this side of the road is the main effluent line that goes from Kinglassy back the way to the Glenorthus effluent treatment plant, a route for my effluent. Glenorthus is 75 years old this year, so it's what we call a new town. And the new towns were very much for the new industrialisation uh, of the, the area. And it's very much a lot of industrial estates, a lot of uh, small businesses growing. So where we are at the moment, at the end of the industrial estate, we have access to the power. Then water. On the other side of the fence there is the main water that comes from the hills. It's the same hills as the source of Highland Spring water, feeds water directly to Glenrothes. So I've got power, gas, effluent, and I've got water. Everything you need. So the design of the, the, the distillery is everything from the road to the perimeter fence is my utilities. Power, gas, and in the corner when we go up, I've got my water. Between the road and the distillery is all my services. So it's got my boiler, it's got my compressors, it's got my cooling tower, and it's got my copper plant, which is this part here. So everything I need is in one location. All the noisy equipment is in one location. And with it being in one easy access location, it makes it a lot easier uh, for just from a general operation. As you find, and that's because it was a modern distillery, so we had an opportunity to do it from the, the very, very start. Are you with me so far? Perfect. Now what I'll do is I'll take you around to the side and then I'll talk a little bit more about sustainability uh, because for any distillery you know, from the, the whisk industry we are very much aware of our uh, duty of care for what we are doing in the environment that we're within and a lot of that is about our sustainability so a lot of work has gone into where we are at this moment in time but I'll explain a little bit at the top because it's easy for you to visualise. Okay, so a few years uh, ago, we, we got a consultant to carry out a carbon footprint analysis of us to understand what is the sources of our carbon. So from that, we identified that 5% of our carbon come, came from our electricity. So we switched right away to a green provider. That's easy bit. The next one is 35% of our energy uh, carbon footprint was coming from the burning of the gas from the boiler. That's my boiler there. You can see the vent thing coming out. At this moment in time, I have a capacity of the distillery of 2 million litres. This whole concept was designed to have four. So later this year, I'll be putting in new stills and be running with a capacity of 4 million litres. In order to do that, I need a bigger boiler. So rather than putting another boiler in, the one I've got now is three tonnes. Rather than putting another three tonnes in, I'm going to put in a six tonne boiler. But for this boiler, I'm going to get it so that it's hydrogen ready. What that means it will be, once we get hydrogen to say it can run in hydrogen. The hydrogen, to produce hydrogen, you can do electrolysis of water. We need quite a lot of uh, energy for it. So we are working with a main provider who have lots of 
wind turbines, so they're creating green electricity. They'll use that green electricity to convert water into hydrogen. We will get the hydrogen delivered to site. And where that embankment is behind me, we will cut into it and it'll be wide enough to hold three road tankers. Now you think a road tanker is quite a big, I mean it's got a volume for a spirit tanker, it can hold 30,000 litres in a tanker. A tanker of hydrogen will store four tonnes because the tanker is pressurised to 350 bar in order to liquefy the hydrogen and I will use one of them every single day. So that's not going to come along until 2025, 2026 but we're making the investment in the new boiler now to make sure that it's available going forward. So it will run in gas now but once we have the opportunity to switch, we'll switch. Like every other distillery, we have co-products of pot ale and draft. Originally we did have those, the draft went to local farmers and the pot ale did get spread for a little bit, but that needs a lot of management. We then sent the, the pot ale to an anaerobic digestion plant in Falkirk in Greensmouth area. But since last year, we, I don't know which road you came up, did you come up the Clooney Clays road, the big road at the bottom there? Maybe not. But over there is a farm, and the farm has an anaerobic digestion plant. So all my pot ale and draft goes to them. They'll convert that into biogas. The biogas is fed into the same gas main that I take my connection from, and I will take the gas. We did look at taking biogas straight from them, but the tariffs that they currently get for putting it into the main gas meant it just become cost prohibitive. Hence the reason why we've gone to hydrogen, because it's the only way forward. Ian started speaking about Fife Providence. When you look at our carbon footprint, about 65% of what we produce from a carbon footprint point of view is the malt and the farming of the barley. They are 50-50 responsible for it. We work with Muntins, which is a fairly small, purely with Muntins. They're a small family-owned business, but they're doing a lot in how they can reduce their footprint. But then we come to the barley. So the barley, they say it's got a large carbon footprint. What happens is when you plough a field, all the nitrogen that you put in in the form of the fertiliser comes out as nitrous. And that has the same equivalent of about 250 times the, car the greenhouse effect as carbon dioxide. So a small improvement on that will have a big reduction in our carbon footprint. So we're doing a lot of work because we want to look with the farmers of is there farming techniques that we can use or is there varieties of barley that don't require as much fertiliser in order to grow because it's all about, we're not going to tell a farmer how to do their job but if we can, there's a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of conversation, it's all going to improve in my supply chain. So that's where we are, that's why we're, the five provenance is very important for us. So what I'll do now is I'll take you around the corner and I'll start the, the true conversation of where we are from the distillery production point of view. Do I have any questions so far? Superb. Okay, so this is where we start Ian and I's engineering. Two malt silos. The trailer comes in, parks up, we put the screw behind the trailer, goes along the screw, along the bottom conveyor, up the elevator and along the top screw to fill the silo. And a lot of distilleries, that's what they do. But then what a lot, a lot of distilleries do is they then have a separate system to empty it. Not as the same system to fill it empties it. You'll see at the bottom I've got a slide. So what happens is I activate the bottom screw, the, the grain goes into the bottom screw, it goes up the same elevator, but rather than going back into the silo, it goes down a lovely chute into the batch bin. So thereby I'm utilizing the same equipment. And the thing is with this type of equipment, it doesn't like not working. So if it's running all the time or more regularly, less chance of breakdown. Now when you do have a breakdown, it stops everything. But the chances of that breaking down is less because it's getting used in a far more uh, efficient way. So from here, it gets loaded into a batch bin. Our batch bin holds four tonnes. That's the standard uh, batch. And that's about as common as we, we have at the starting process because rather than going into a roller mill, we then go into a hammer mill. So what I'll do is I'll take you next door to show you our hammer mill and talk a little bit about what impact that has on the grist. Okay, this is where I'm hoping to get some at least one question. So I've got faith in you that you will ask a question. Please, please, please ask a question. Because if you don't ask a question, I think that I'm either not explaining enough or I'm boring you. So I don't want it to be either of them. So come this way. So everybody, I'm assuming, has seen grist. 
If you haven't seen grist, please put your hand up. So this is grist from a traditional distillery using a roller mill. That's my grist. You can take a sample. Don't worry, I'll give you a bucket to put it back in. So it's got more, it's more flower-like than anything else, and that's because I put it through a hammer mill. And the reason why I put it through a hammer mill is I don't have a mash tun. If you look about, there is no mash tun. I have a mash filter, and that's a completely different way of thinking. In a traditional mash tun, you use the grist as your filter aid for your wort and your mixture. I have a mash filter, so I mechanically separate out the solids to the liquids. So I don't need it to have all the husk within it. I want it all to be flour. And by doing that, I have a one of these, which is a hammer mill. So what the hammer mill is, is I've got the batch spin at the top. I've got a shaft that's spinning very fast. And on the shaft, I've got flails of metal at strategic locations. So as the grain comes down, I'll hit it once, twice, three times and more. And that breaks up and pulverizes the grain. Then what happens is it passes through a screen. So only the smallest of the particle will pass through here. Hence the reason why I've got the very, very fine grist. Are you with me so far? Perfect. I want to talk a little bit about rye for a little bit. Because we'll talk about it a little bit more detail from the grain point of view, but I want to talk about it from the processing point of view. So this might be a little bit hard, so I might use Julie as an example. Julie. Uh, if, you, if you put that in your hands and show people, this is malted barley. You want to see some? This is rye. It's a, it's a lot smaller grain. Okay. So you'll see that the, the malt and the, the rye are separate grains. We use malted rye, which already differentiates us from a lot of other distilleries. A lot of distilleries who use rye, it's unmalted. But if you were in a traditional distillery, you would have to change the setting of your mill in order to accommodate the rye. By having the hammer mill, I don't have that problem because it's all passing through the same level of screen. It's got, so I'm, a, I'm creating a, my mixture in here. By having the grist so fine, it's enabling me to extract a lot more flavours from the cereal. And by extracting the more cereal flavours at this point, because as we all know in a distillery, the flav what flavours I don't get at this point, I'm not creating anywhere else in the site. All I can do is develop it further in the processing of it. If I don't have it at this point, I'm not going to get it through the distillation. With me so far? Perfect. So I take my grist and I transfer it into my grist case here. From there, I transfer it up my elevator to the first stage of my fermentation, my, my mashing process. This is my mash conversion vessel. In a traditional distillery, you would, you would mix the grist with the water in your mash tun and you convert all your starch into sugars. I do it in a mash conversion vessel, which is just a big tank and a mixer on the bottom. But what makes it different is it's got steam coil on the outside of it. Rye specifically has a high level of beta-glucans in it. But it also has beta-glucanase enzyme within the corn. The problem being is that it's denatured above 50 degrees. So if you're in a traditional distillery, you're mashing in to get your sarification of your starch first and foremost. So if you go in at your 64, 63 and a half degrees, you denature the very enzyme that you can use to break down your beta-glucans. And what that will do is during your mashing process, it will hold on to the liquid. Your wort will not get out. The examples I've been given when I've been speaking to other distilleries who have tried dry is that they would normally get a mash done in about five hours. For some of them, the mashes got stuck and it took them like 30 hours to drain it out. But having the mash conversion vessel, I go in it 45 degrees 
I will slowly heat it up to 64 degrees. And during that heating cycle, I'm getting the beta glucan has been activated, breaking down the beta glucans. I then get all the wonderful work of the amylase uh, enzymes to uh, the the enzymes to break down the starch into the various sugars to get to 64 degrees. I will then hold it for about an hour, and that just ensures I've got all the heat transfer, getting all that conversion taking place. I then do a small increase to temperature to 70 degrees. That is the transfer. That just reduces the viscosity of the mixture enough to enable me to transfer it through my mash filter. Are you with me so far? Superb. What we'll do now is I'm going to take you upstairs and I'm going to show you the samples of my mash, my draft, my wort and my wash. Just so you can start to get an understanding of the flavours. I have a question. Did I understand you correctly that you don't have to adjust the mill for different kinds of milk? No. We, we adjust the mill for other reasons, yeah. but for tra transitioning to other grains, we don't have to. And here we've used it for malted barley, we've done it with wheat, with oats and with rye. Each time the system has been adequate and capable of doing it. And that's the, the beauty of having a hammer mill. It doesn't matter the grain type, it will cope with it. Whether it's with a roller mill, yeah, there's a lot more work required to get it to operate. But for the hammer mill, hammer mill is a good friend of a distillery manager because we, I know it's capable of processing most grains. Does a hammer mill only make sense if you have a mesh filter, or does it make sense if you have a... Well, if you have a mash tun, your, your grist would be so fine it would go straight through the, the perforated plates. It only works if you've got a mechanical means of separating it. So by having this enables me to have this, which enables me to process this. Again, first aim, material. We want to be changing different materials, and I can only do that if I've got the methodology that's capable of doing it. So this is the engineering solution to be able to process all these different grains. For the grains, do you always keep them separate or do you combine them with the grist? I keep them separate in the silos, but I weigh them and mix them together in the batch bin. I do a mash bill as a mixed grain mash bill. So it's about 53% rye, 47% the malt. That gets mixed in here. It'll mill and be mixed here, and then it'll ultimately be mixed in there. We keep, no, it's a mixture from the start. Any experiment to ingest rye as well? Uh, well, we've done oats. Okay. Uh, I've done wheat as well. Again, get, giving, get, look, we're, we're, we have a quest for flavour. We want to understand what does that bring to the table. So the three that I gave there, the rye, the wheat, and the oats is a great example. Because what I did was with the rye, I changed the rye component with wheat. Exact same percentages, produced a liquid. The same with the oats, the exact same mash bill with only oats in the malted barley. So then I'm looking and understanding the impact and influence the grain has on the flavour of the spirit. So this is a mass conversion vessel. The grist comes straight down, and this in here is where we add the water. And this is a cool bit of engineering, and the water comes in at 90 degrees to the flow of the water into the grist. And what happens is it spins and it takes out the energy and it falls down exactly with it. So I get perfect mixing as it goes into the mash conversion vessel. So it's in the mash conversion vessel for about an hour and a half doing the heating cycle. Once it's finished, the resulting mixture is like porridge. Now, a lot of people, you say it's like porridge and everybody goes, but I know a lot of people are going, what does he mean? So I've got a sample here. It's just separated because it was done last night. So, this is my wash. Let me just nose it. Yeah, so you can still get the, the normal. Now, this is a standard mash here at this point. It's not my rye one. It's just demonstrating the what the equipment can do. Oh, Have you noticed it? <laughs> so that's my mash. So once it's all been converted, I want to separate out the solids from the liquids. Okay? If you want to stand at that side, let's explain this next bit. So what I do is I pump this mixture here through this plate. And you'll see I've got a series of plates. You, you maybe notice I've got a thick plate and a thin plate. Thick, thin, thick, thin. Okay? 
The thin plate has a membrane on either side of it. The thick plate has a cloth. So in the gap between the plates, I'll have a membrane on this side, cloth in that side, cloth that side, membrane that side. You with me? And what I do is I pump the mixture, and the mixture fills the cavity between the plates. And as it's pumping its way through it, the, the membrane doesn't allow anything to pass by it. But the cloth will allow liquid to pass through it. So what I do is the pressure of pumping it means I keep the solids behind, which will become my draft, and my liquid, my wort, passes out. So I get a very, very clear wort because I'm doing mechanical filtering. Then what happens is once I've emptied the mass conversion vessel, I inflate the membranes. So in these packs here, I blow them up like a balloon. They go like that. So if you can imagine that expanding in either side, it's like you getting a tea bag and squeezing it. So every bit of that I'm squeezing to get every last drop of water out of my draft. But then I'm not ready. I'm not finished yet. I'll then do a sparge. So what I do is I then take hot water about 78 degrees and I'll pass it through the grist, the plates again. Because I want to get every last drop of that sugary wort out. Then that's what I do. But just near the end, the last 2,000 litres of my sparge, I'll keep back and put it into my weak wort tank. And I, I then, then use that at the start of my next mash. So it's very much around the same principles as first, second and third water. Just in a slightly different way. You with me? Do you see that? How long does it take for the, the actual... Mash it. For yeah. the, so the mashing of this, the transferring of it will take about an hour and a half each time. Then what happens is, once I've finished the mashing, the, the ram here gets moved back. And the, you'll see I've got a chain here. There's a little flight there that'll come out, hook the plate and open it. And all it does is it'll then separate each of the plates. And then the separation of the plates allows the draft to fall into a screw below and it gets blown out into the wagon that we saw. So this is the, sorry. So this is the draft. So you'll see it's, it has got the, the, the serial element that you get, but it's a lot more finer. Very dry. Very dry. Because we've done all that squeezing, we've got all the extract out of it. Almost like sawdust. Yes. Sorry. Let me, let me just check this. It was taken last night. Yep. So this is my wart. <laughs> Wait till you get the next one. So what I do from here is I've got my wonderful sugary wort. So I put it to my wash back. I have got four wash backs that are 80,000 litres in capacity. For the ma a single mash of four tonnes of the cereal will give me about 17,000 litres of wort. But I don't do 17,000 litres into a wash back. I'll do four mashes, one after the other, into the same wash back. And the wash backs that I have are all stainless steel and all outside. And then I'll add the yeast with each mash. And then after about 50 hours of fermentation, all my fermentation is complete. The sugary wort is of a higher original gravity as a normal distillery. A lot of distilleries are looking for about 1060 of their, I'm looking for 1070 to 1075. By having the mash filter, I can get a far more concentrated wort. By having more sugars, means I can get more flavors. Well, is the mash filter more efficient in terms of time than standard? It's, tons? from a time point of view, it, there was a lot of theory that it was only more efficient with regards to extract. But over the years, Farmers and maltsters have been very good to distillers in producing fantastic quality. Where the mash filter comes in its own is if you're doing different grains or you have a problematic barley, it will process it, whereas a traditional mash tun won't. 
mash, fil mash filters are more expensive and more complicated to run. So you won't see manual guys doing one of these because it takes a computer to think of the brains. But where you get the benefit is if you're different grains and it gives me the flexibility that I, I'm looking for. So once it's out the, in the wash back for a minimum of 50 hours, that doesn't mean I don't go above that. I do. But for the bulk of it, I'm, it was a minimum of 50 hours. I get my wash. And my wash is at about 10% to 10.5% alcohol. So this is just the wash that we're taking from last night. I want you to talk about the distillery. We talk about material and method. So one of the methods for the, for the rye, I'll give you an example. We have the, the, the mash bill is malted barley, malted rye. We put it through the mash filter. I then add a, a yeast specifically to the rye. But I want to expand on the other Engineering brand products. We're doing a single malt, but we don't do us do it like anyone else. We do four seasons. So I do a spring, a summer, a win an autumn, a winter campaign. The spring and summer I use spring barley. I will mash it like here, but I will use a different yeast. I will put it into the washbacks, and because of uh, the outside conditions, will have an influence on the fermentation. So the spring and summer uses my spring barley. My autumn and winter uses winter barley. And the winter barley gives me far more, and it gives me an increase in turbidity of the wort. So I've got a lot more of the malt notes coming through. I then use different yeasts for them as well. So my spring and summer are quite light and delicate. My autumn and winter are very hard and robust. I have four different styles of spirit covering the four seasons using a combination of the mash filter and yeast because yeast is one of the processes and a lot of distilleries have only been using standard distiller yeast but in the last probably five, six years distillers are starting to experiment a little bit more thinking, do you know what? Yeast creates the flavour in the fermentation let's look at different flavours in the fermentation so that's what they've been looking for and that's been part of our DNA from the very beginning we like to call it as one of the levers that we want to pull so after the fermentation and the washback, we're ready to do the distillation. So what I'm doing, now that the distillation is off, unfortunately, you'll not see it coming into the safe. We're going to go back here and I'll show you the distillation. Okay? So everybody knows the principle of distillation is to take the alcohol we have in the fermenta after fermentation and concentrate it. And we use that in the basic principle of that alcohol and water have different boiling points. So a traditional distillery, we have, like everybody else, two stills. A wash still and a spirit still. Same as before. But we start to use a little bit more engineering. A normal traditional distillery, the stills would have internal coils. I don't have internal coils. I've got an internal, external heat exchanger. And this is where I'm going to be a little bit scientific. If I get too scientific, let me know. So bear with me. Directly above me is a steam pipe about 8 bar pressure. It, it goes into the heat exchanger, it cools down and becomes condensate. So it's going doing that. I take the contents of my still, pass it through the heat exchanger and bring it back in. So I'm doing that all the time. And all I'm doing in here is transferring the energy heat from the steam into the wash, which allows the wash to then boil. You with me so far? Right. So, boiling my still, vapour passes up the live, okay, yep. swan egg into the live pipe to the first of my two condensers. So this is where we start to differentiate. I don't have one condenser, I have two. So the first one, can you remember what I said of what happens to the steam? When you cool down steam, it makes condensate. So I take that condensate, which is cooled steam, and I put it up to the top. Who, who all stayed in the Dakota last night? The, the wonderful showers that feels like you're standing in rain. That's what's up the top. So up the top, I've got that shower effect. This is a shell and tube heat exchanger. So I've got a copper shell and I've got copper pipes. And in the copper pipes, what happens is the water condensate falls into the tubes and it falls on the outside of the tube. And as that, that water is falling down, the hot vapour is hitting it. And what happens is we transfer the heat from the vapour into the condensate. At the bottom of the condenser, 
they're separated. And what happens is the condensate comes into this tank here and the vapour goes into the tank there. Are you all with me so far? Right, now a wee bit of geekiness. We use what's called a TVR, thermal vapour recompression. Simplistically, what I have in here is an orifice plate. In the pipe, the steam pipe, I restrict the flow. And by in order to maintain the same pressure, it speeds up. What that does at the point of that speeding up, it creates a vacuum. And you'll see behind me is a pipe. That pipe goes into that tank there. So it means that that tank becomes under vacuum. And when you have hot condensate under vacuum, it will flash off its steam at a much lower temperature. So what I do is I flash my steam back into here, back in to be used in there. As a result, I'm using 40% less energy on a similar size traditional distillery. From the first condenser, the vapour that's not condensed will then pass up the second pipe into my second condenser. And in the second condenser, I take warm water at 40 degrees, put it in the bottom, pass it through all the tubes, and at the top I get hot water about 85 degrees. So the distillery, the distillery takes warm water and creates hot water. The mashing process takes that hot water and makes warm water. So we get a balance in the process. You with me so far? We do the exact same with the spirit stills. So with the spirit stills, the exact same. And what we do is we control the direct cut points. So as I explained over by, we do inch there in the four seasons. Okay. I then do rye. Thank you. I then do rye, so that's my five. I then also do tin laws, which is my experimental, where I do something different every year. So that's me got six. I then do a peated product that we call King Glassy, that's for me, seven. I then do a peated product called Fin Glassy, which I then exchange and sell to others. I then do Strap Henry, which is my blending mall. I do exchanges to either third party customers or our strategic partner McDuff. And what that does is enables me to do exchanges for grain and for malt. It means then I've got a portfolio of grains and malts that I blend together to create the products for McDuff International. So in a distillery, I do nine different styles of spirit and each one of them is slightly, subtly more different. What do you use the Lomond spill for? I'll come to that, Mark. You're, you're jumping the gun. You're too enthusiastic. Right, so what we've got here is this is the heads of a standard... Oh, I already poured it. That's the heads of the standard Strathenry. So Strathenry is a standard malt I produce. It is about 70% of my entire capacity is Strathenry. And it just is exchanged or it's with, uh, sold to other people. That's the heads. So that there is the spirit. That's the heart of the spirit. That's Strathenry. Get some flavour to it. Yeah, I'd like to see what you think of it, uh, Mike. We are talking about that multi fruitiness, and then just because I want people to know, we talk a lot about faints, but people say, "Well, what's faints?" Unless you really know what faints like. So what I've got here, I've got faints, and what we have in the distillery here is I don't separate out my liquids. The only one I separate out is my spirit cup, my heart, and my ISR. Yes. Thank you. Everything else, so in my fange tank, I will collect my low wines, my head and my tails from the spirit cell, mix them together in the same vat, and then that's what's used to charge the spirit cell. I don't keep them separate, I keep them together. Again, that's adding to the complexity. Rather than keeping it all, also it means I don't need to have as many vats. I don't need to separate them, I'm going to be using them. So Mark then said, what about my third still? What do you think, Mike? Cyrano is more present and sweetness is more We'll come to that later on with that one. So we use these two stills for most of my spirit. The only one I don't do, thank you, is for the Rylo, I use my Loman still, which we'll go to next.
We're just waiting the stragglers coming. Come on. You're missing all the fun. Everybody's seen a spirit still before. Nobody's seen a Loman still before. So this is my Loman still. So a Loman still has got a pot still base and on the neck is a column still. So I've got six plates. Each plate is a perforated plate with what we call a bubble cap on it. So what happens, if you can imagine, in a, the spirit still over by, when we heat up the vapour, it passes straight through the, the neck, unimpeded. But for the loam still, the liquid, the, the vapour, has to pass through six plates. And what happens is, on some of the plates, it will condense and fall back down as a liquid. So it's only the lightest of spirit that gets to the very top. And that's what adds to the character of the rye. The rye is not a very heavy, heavy spirit that you might get for an American or Canadian rye. It's very much our way of doing it, if that makes sense. This is, we, we wanted to have a flavoursome liquid that wasn't overpowering. You still get that want the spice, but not some of the other ones. We also want the lovely maltiness that we have in malt. So the best analogy I can give you is if you have a standard malt whiskey here, a Canadian American rye here, I'm in the middle. That's what I'm looking for. That's the question I have for you all, all this afternoon when we get to taste it. Okay. What we'll do is I'll go downstairs. I'll show you and explain a little bit of the yeast, but I will also, I've got a working replica of what this does downstairs. So it'll he help you visualise what it's doing. Upstairs, I, I spoke about that we add yeast to the wort that goes into my fermenters that are out back. So this is normal liquid distiller's yeast. Got lovely fruitiness to it. Mm. So what I have behind me here, that's my two tanks for my liquid yeast. Nothing extraordinary about it. But for my inch DNA campaigns and for my rye law, I use a dry yeast. So I use this here. So what I do is I load my dry yeast in here. I, I put in warm water into the tank. And what I do is I spin it round. And what happens is it, there's a venturi at the bottom and it draws in the solids and it mixes it as it goes along. So I make up my mixture of my dry yeast and I then add that to the to the washback. And depending on what campaign I'm on, some campaigns I'll use 100% dry yeast and nothing else. Other campaigns I'm looking for some dry yeast and liquid yeast to give me the flavour. So this here is that yeast that's been dried. So this is standard distiller, and it, just to show you the difference in it, you don't get the lovely creaminess. But where this has a benefit, and there's a lot of uh, distillers use it, is you can store this dry yeast for three years and it will be absolutely fine when you rehydrate it. So see for people that have either got like some of the islands or if they've got interruptible power supplies, they'll use that because it's easier for them to store. Where we're standing, you'll see that I've got quite a bit of space. So uh, during the summer, in fact, in July, the loam is still, which you saw here, I'm moving it and putting it there. And then in its place, I'm putting a wash still there and a spirit still there. And then that'll enable me to increase the capacity. The mash filter has the capacity to do more throughput than it currently is at the moment. My stills is a rate determining step, but this will enable me to do 4 million litres. We spoke upstairs about the low man still, about the bubble plates and the cap, the bubble plate caps and the plates. This is what they look like. Now this isn't spirit, this is just water to replicate it. But you can imagine this is a boiling. The vapour passes up through here and you can see the vapour in the presence of the bubbles. It passes up through here to come out the top. But you'll also see I've got liquid on the plates because what happens is some of the vapour will condense and it'll fall onto the liquid. If it's really heavy, it'll fall the way down here. But if not, it'll stay in this plate here in that state. So we're then looking for the, the vapour that I collect only is the lightest that comes out the top. And that's what I do for the rye law. Do you use the lemon still only for the rye? At the moment, I've used it for the rye, for the oats, and for the wheat. I'm 
I want to do more tinkering with it, but that's part of my print lodge collection that I spoke about. I only get one week to do it, and I've got so many ideas. Trying to fit it all into one week is proven to be very, very difficult. Because I think as a still, it's going to give me a lot more versatility and flexibility and a lot of different flavour profiles. So one of the, the obvious ones that I'll do is I'll do triple distillation by using the Loma still as a third distillation. I spoke at the start that by the rye, we just didn't do the rye. We got support from a uh, local company, uh, sorry, companies to do it on a smaller scale. So this is my pilot still. So I want you to think back 2017 about, it was about a uh, fact that it was about this time in 2017, I was distilling, I distilled all the original rye. And ha up until that point, I am part of the nosing team here, so he knows all the spirit I produce and all the spirit that comes to sight. So I created this, I had distilled this liquid that was made from rye, and I nosed it, and I tasted it, and I thought, this is so different, this is wonderful. I then spoke to Ian and he, and we both agreed, and we said, right, we're going to have to do this in full scale. So the best analogy is, is the rye law started off a bit like our print laws, a bit experimental, but when we produced the liquid here, we thought, this has got, this is so different. So what we did is, when we, we did it here, we did it again in full scale in December 2017. And the liquid that I produced in the full scale was even better than what I'd done in the pilot scale. And as a result of that, that's why Rye Law is now uh, every year. Every year I do it, uh, two weeks a year. The first year only did one week because if you think about the, the supply chain, to get the final grain, you have to grow it. And then you have to, so you have to acquire the seed. You have to put it in the ground. You've got to then grow it, which is another year. You've then got to harvest it and you get it the following year. So it's about three years in the making just to get that product. So the, in the first year we did it, we went looking for rye and it was like, who's got rye? Nobody used rye and grain eh, for distilling. We managed to get some rye from a farm up in the north of Scotland in the Black Isle. And what had happened is rye predominantly in Scotland is grown as a green crop. So what happens is they'll grow it and before it starts to get the, the corns forming, they'll cut it and they'll harvest it and they'll put it into an anaerobic digestion plant to create biogas because that's what rye does. Rye can grow in a lot of difficult conditions. But fortunate for me, but not for the company, there was a bio plant that had actually overrun during the commissioning so they couldn't use it. So the farmer actually grew the crop to full and we got the grain. So it was like their loss was my gain. So that enabled us to actually distill it. And as I said, as a result of that, it's become a stable of my production every year. And it's the only one that I use the Loman still with all the time. I've never done the rye on my spirit still because the flavour profile I get from the Loman still meets my expectations. We're, we're small enough we can make quick decisions, but I'm a bit big to be doing a lot of tinkering, if that makes sense. So we're just at that size. That, that's why we've got the pilot still. So this is John. So John is one of our six operators. So when Ian and I were recruiting for the distillery, uh, Glen Rothit had a paper mill called Tillis Russell and it went into administration in the, the March. So Ian and I had a, an opportunity to recruit people. We chose not to go for people that had whiskey making experience. We chose people that had the right mindset and behaviour. So we recruited John, and as a result, the initial five operators were all Tillis Russell. A lot of people ask us, well, why did you do that? I can train an operator to understand distillation and mashing and everything else, but if they don't have the right mindset and behaviour for what we are trying to do here, that's even more difficult. Also, if you to come from another distillery, they would have this pre-dispensation or uh, pre-mindset that I produce one spirit and only one spirit. I make nine. And they would do, no, what's that? Whereas the operators here no, don't know any different. So it's now second nature. By doing the nine, what we have is I've got a recipe that we've developed over the years that gives me a list of all the, the grain, the process conditions and the casks that we put it in. And that's like my big, my recipe. So each time I'm doing my campaign, I'll bring out my recipe book. We review it with operators for the conditions and we operate it for that two period of time. Then when we go back onto a new liquid, We'll do the same thing and then as the nosing team we'll get together because if we go from one liquid to the, ne to the next it's making sure that we're not getting any contamination crossover. When we go from a non-peated to a, a peated it's okay but if you go from a peated to a non-peated we do need to do a lot more uh, work by flushing out the system. For the inch seasons and for the rye law we keep the faints.
So the faints I've caught the now is from last year. That means I've got a good starting point, and it means I'm not using my Strathenry faints for making my rye. I've kept this faints separate each time, and what we do is we pump it out and put it into to IBCs. So this is the main control room. This is the 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 hub. This is a what's the what's the fancy word for NASA's key base? Houston is mission it control, mission control? Yeah. This is mission control. Thank you, John. So we have one operator in here who controls everything from the malt coming in to the spirit going over there. We're a 24-7 operation for 50 weeks of the year. So from 6 o'clock tonight until 6 o'clock tomorrow morning, there's only an operator and the security guard. And the security guard is responsible for the security of the sites and the operator is responsible for everything else. So that's why we've got cam cameras of the site and cameras in the distillery so we've got full visibility. So this is the system that we use to control the whole process. So this is the milling, the grain handling system. So that's the silos, mill, the grist case. This here is this, the setting. So I can change the settings of what size my batch bin uh, load wants to be. So when I go to like, so the rye, the mash size is only 3.3 .3 tonnes rather than 4. For the mashing process, this is my mash conversion vessel and that's my mash filter. The key thing to take away there is a lot of equipment, a lot of valves. This is not something that the guy is there pulling the valves and pushing the buttons. The operator starts a sequence and the system will get to a certain stage that the operator then has to say move to the next stage and move to the next stage. But the operator purely to maintain it because for the mash filter to run you have to maintain a pressure all across the filter bed the whole time. If you lose that pressure, you will then lose the filter bed, which will lose your extract ability because then you'll have dead spots or zones that will just be unimpeded and will pass through it. So that's why there's a lot of brains in there. So that's why we have one operator, but he's looking at the process all the time. The system is doing the brain stuff in the background, but the operator is about starting the sequence from one phase to the next. Then from the distillery, because we have the wonderful energy efficiency, there's a lot of information here. This is just the point being there's a lot of science and engineering behind the, the running of the stills. TBR, you need to have the brains behind it. You know, a, a traditional distillery with levers and buttons, this would be the step too far. But we're a modern distillery, so we embrace modern ways of working. You asked the question, Julie. So for the Loman still, the Loman still control is different to uh, the spirit still. Not in the fact it's got the plates, but how we control it. So in a normal spirit still, you have the head, the heart and the tails. In a normal distillery, we then change that by the conditions that we get. So we so we know once we charge the still and it, become, it boils up, the first 10, 15 minutes is where we get the heads. We then get the, the hearts and the hearts is based on the high cut point of about 76 and the low point of about 67 then their faints is anything less than that, 67. But the system will control, when it changes from the spirit strength to that point, it will automatically change from heads to heart and heart to tails. You with me? The loam is still, I tell it what the heads are, I tell it what the heart is. So that's where you need, it, by, it gives me a lot more control, but it needs, means I've got to be on the ball. And what that means is, a normal distillation curve will come high, you get to the heads, It'll come down, you'll get to the heart, and then it'll come down further and you've got your tails. For the loam still, it comes in, I get the head to a certain volume, and then it starts collecting the spirit, the heart. But rather than it being on a strength point of view, I can say, I want the strength of that liquid to be 70% or 72%. It will maintain that strength. And the how it does that is it does reflux, recycle. So what happens is the spirit that gets produced as soon as the spirit in the neck starts to drop, it'll return some of that liquid back into the plates, bring the strength of the system back up, and I maintain that strength. Now where that becomes very, it gives me a lot of control on the spirit cut, so I know that that cut is all 70%, but where the, the difficulty is, if I go too greedy, it means I might start to get some of the faint notes. So you're always getting that balance of getting the constant strength but not going too too long, otherwise I start to get a faintiness. And that's where a lot of the original work gets done. So the recipe book that I have defines that cut point and that length volume. However, every batch that we do for every year, I'm in here for the days, nosing 
and sampling it to make sure that there's no any deviation because like everything, the fermentations are going to change depending on the outside conditions. When we did it the first year, we did it in December. So already we're at a disadvantage is that the fermentation is affecting by the outside temperature. So now I do it in August. I do it in what in theory should be the hottest month because I want a lovely esters. So I want a hot... I want my fermentations to get quite hot. I want it to go up to about 35 degrees, 36 degrees, because I want it to form all those wonderful uh, esters that I d couldn't quite get in the, the, the first year. And what I want is I want to be careful that during my distillation, all those lovely esters I've created, I'm not trying to be, you know, and by bringing in a light character spirit, all those esters are coming to the forefront. But I need to be careful that I don't take the heart too long, because if I take it too long, I start bringing some of the fainting notes, which will then take it away.